Alleluia! Christ is risen! Christ is risen indeed! Alleluia! Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parch, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still water. At the cross you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for water in this font, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty. Give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Holy Lord, within your church, your followers have often allowed their disagreements to get in the way of being faithful to your word. Remove any barriers our communities face that prevent us from sharing your word and building upon your church. Amen. The first reading is a reading from Mark, the ninth chapter. But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was to be the greatest. Jesus sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to both Acts and 1 Corinthians. Glory to you, O Lord. 
After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was one of the same tribe, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade, they were tent makers. Every Sabbath, he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. And from 1 Corinthians. Now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Paulus, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Uh, yeah, I did baptize also the house of the Stephanus. But beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Paul, I think, can be a bit of a challenge to hear in our North American context. I think in part because Paul just lives in a different time and place than we do. There's a great amount of cultural differences between the first century Mediterranean world and the 21st century North American world. And then there are times, I think, like today, in Paul's letter to the first Corinthians, where part of what he is doing, part of what he wants to do, is to be a challenge. He wants to challenge the way those, that early church in Corinth is doing things. He wants to disrupt the status quo. And so part of what makes Paul so challenging for us is that sometimes that's exactly what he wants to do. And Paul seldom writes to a particular individual. His letters are to entire groups of people, to an early church, to an assembly of followers of Jesus. And that sort of cuts across much of our kind of individual notions within our 21st century North American culture as well. Add in just a little bit extra challenge to be able to kind of hear what Paul has to say. And one example of why or how Paul is challenging for us to hear is that it is not uncommon to hear these words from Paul that were read this morning as him essentially being defensive or defending his inability to speak well in public. He admits that he is not the most eloquent speaker. And so when we hear words like eloquent wisdom, that might be our first impulse is to think that what Paul is really trying to do is saying that Cephas might be a better speaker, Apollos might be a better speaker, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are right or that their gospel is somehow better than what I gave to you, the very church that Paul himself started. But I don't think that's really what's going on here. Paul's not trying to defend his ability to, for public speaking over against the others. If it was, how could he add Christ to that same list that includes himself, Cephas, and Apollos? Instead, Paul, I think, is challenging these first Corinthians. Because 
essentially what they are trying to do and what they are doing. What he has heard from Chloe's people is that they are essentially doing things the way that they normally would. And so we don't have much of an idea of what, say, Apollos would have taught those early Christians. We don't even know if Cephas ever visited the church in Corinth. And all we have of Paul's teachings and how he established the church come from his letters. And so it's not even really a question over whether Apollos or Cephas got something wrong that Paul wants to sort of countermand, that he wants to make sure and correct. I mean, after all, Christ is part of that list as well. And Paul, I think, would be fairly safe to say, is not going to try to correct something that Christ had taught those early Christians. And so it's not so much a doctrinal issue either, or just a matter of belief. But it is sort of about this argument for who kind of is greatest. Those who had been baptized by Paul are claiming that they are somehow better than the other people in the assembly. Those who had been baptized by Apollos are saying that Apollos is superior to both Paul and Cephas. And so we are the ones who should be making the decisions. It is our theology, our beliefs, that are right. And those who are saying Cephas are doing something very similar. And then there are those who essentially try to say, it is only Christ that we follow. And so it should be our words, our thoughts, our ideology that counts most. They have managed to sort of bring in that status of the world into the congregation, that constant sort of challenge that we oftentimes face within our own culture to be better and to be greater. That, I think, is what eloquent wisdom is for Paul. He is not arguing that wisdom or knowledge that comes from outside the church is inherently wrong. This is not a critique of, say, scientific knowledge or or historical facts or even philosophy itself. He is arguing more of how these things oftentimes are used. That, I think, is the challenge that Paul brings to the first Corinthians. And that is what he is hoping to sort of disrupt. He, and he interrupts their status quo by essentially dropping the word of the cross into its midst. Because it's hard to argue who is greatest when we are talking about sort of a crucified Messiah. I mean, the one place we would not expect to find God is on a cross. And I know that can be somewhat of a challenge for us in the 21st century North American context because we have become used to the cross and seeing it as a symbol, as a symbol of Christianity and even in some ways as a symbol of triumph and victory. And so we've kind of lost a lot of the original meaning of the cross, the way that Paul and those in Corinth would have seen it as an utterly disreputable, despicable, humiliating experience. Only the weakest and worst would be found on the cross. And yet that is exactly, exactly where Paul says that God is at. God is not to be found in greatness, at least not as we understand it. God is found in what is weakest, what is oftentimes considered shameful and disreputable. That is where we encounter God. We encounter God in the cross. And it is that understanding that breaks down all of these kinds of divisions. And that, I think, is where the challenge 
of healing Paul becomes so difficult for us in the 21st century North American context. Because we kind of do the same thing that is going on in that church in Corinth. Think of how we operate. What is our eloquent wisdom? It's not scientific knowledge or historical knowledge. It is things like slogans, sound bites, tweets, little pieces of information that are constantly bombarding us, that leave very little room for any kind of depth of engagement. Tweets, posts, sound bites, slogans that oftentimes project our ideology, our beliefs as being the only correct ones, the only ones that could possibly exist. And oftentimes they go even that step further to sort of vilify those who have different views than us. It is a very sort of seductive kind of wisdom or knowledge. And it's easy to kind of understand why. I mean, first of all, in our context, we are constantly bombarded by information, some of which is true, a lot of which is kind of a mixture of both truth and false. And then some of it is just plain false. But increasingly, and perhaps disturbingly, there is even a greater amount that is made up on the spot. That is conjecture. That is finding conspiracies where none exist. But its seductiveness goes beyond just sort of a lazy intellectual habits as well. It goes beyond it because essentially this kind of knowledge, this eloquent wisdom, as Paul puts it, or as NRSV translates it, is seductive because it is the kind of wisdom that promotes our beliefs, our ideologies. It is what we oftentimes believe is going to make us the greatest. And here, I think, is where that challenge really comes home for many of us in our North American context. Because we have heard from probably about the time that we were born and to our, our final days as adults, that we are exceptional, that we are the greatest nation that has ever existed, that our ways and culture have transformed the world around us. And while there's nothing wrong with taking pride in our country and being sort of patriotic in when it's called for, it also needs to be tempered. Because the kinds of things that oftentimes, we, because the way we conceive of greatness is one that stands in almost direct opposition to the cross. And so as Christians, we see the world differently. We can hear Paul's challenge, a challenge that breaks all of those statuses. So it's no longer sort of our greatness that we need to promote. It's no longer our ability to dominate, whether that be in a conversation or across the globe. It is no longer power that is found in greatness, but it is God who is found in weakness. And that idea has the ability to kind of transform the world around us. And that is what Paul has found in his experience of Jesus. He went from being a persecutor of the church to eradicating who he thought were the enemies of God to be one of its best proponents, one of its greatest expounders, all because of his encounter with the crucified Messiah, realizing that his ideas of greatness were all part 
of this worldly culture, what he calls sin and death, with a capital S and a capital D. Paul understands that we are trapped in these systems. And as a result, we don't always understand what it is that we are doing. But what Paul also understands is that the power of God is found in the weakness of the cross. And it is that power that has the ability to transform the world. It is that power that should be transforming those in the Corinthian church. Not because they were first worthy, but because God's grace is so incongruous that it picks and it transforms people despite their worth or their value or how good or how great they are. It breaks down all of these statuses, all of these barriers that we erect between ourselves, keeping us from forming real community, allowing us to dismiss things we don't disagree with. The power of the cross challenges us to confront that in our world, that which is wrong in our world, to see it clearly, to see it for what it is, and to understand that God is not to be found in the greatest places, but is found most often and most frequently in places of weakness and despair. That runs counter to almost everything we believe, but that also has the ability to turn us as those who follow this crucified Messiah toward neighbor, toward stranger, towards creature, and towards all creation itself. Because God is turning the world upside down. Amen.
Let us confess our faith as found in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Build us up, Mother and God, as living stones united in our spiritual house. Continually strengthen your church as it is sent forth to proclaim your love. We pray especially for new congregations and those in redevelopment. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Humble us, Creator God, as part of your creation. Fill us with respect and awe for the world you have made, including volcanoes, ocean currents, tropical rainstorms, glaciers, and other forces that both destroy and create. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Our line, our ways to your love, O God. We pray for countries, leaders, and other organizations as they prepare places for those seeking refuge and safety. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of healing and rest, help those whose hearts are heavy and weighed down by many troubles. Comfort their suffering, ease their distress, and carry their burdens. We especially pray for those that we name before you silently or out loud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Nurturing God, we pray for those who tend and teach young children, for the safe pregnancies of expectant parents, and for families who struggle with infertility and miscarriage. We give thanks for all who have sown mothering care, and we remember all for whom this day is difficult. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Generous God, you call into your brilliant light all who have died. Give us faith to take hold of the promise of your eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. Thank you for everyone who has continued to send in uh, your offerings during this time. Uh, they have been of great help and have allowed us to continue to bring you Sunday morning worship services, even though we are virtual. Although virtually we are able to connect with more people across our region uh, than what we would normally be on a Sunday morning. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, ruler of heaven and earth. Day by day you shower us with blessings. As you have raised us to new life in Christ, Give us glad and generous hearts, ready to praise you and to respond to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
we give thanks for the word. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you have made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water from the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of yourself given love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gift within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen, just as he said. Go in peace, share the good news. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia.